You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. Dr. Kipping is the Assistant Professor of Astronomy at Columbia University, where he researches extrasolar planets and moons. Dr. Kipping also leads the Cool Worlds Lab at Columbia, which includes a YouTube channel and a website where you can learn about their research. Dr. Kipping's other areas of research interests also include study and characterization of transiting exoplanets, exoplanet atmospheres, Bayesian inference, population statistics and understanding stellar hosts. He is also the principal investigator of the hunt for the exomoons with Kepler HEK project. Today's video was created in partnership with Forio Sweden. Forio's skincare uses T-Sonic pulsations with microcurrent technology to massage and improve blood flow through layers of skin. The microcurrents use a low voltage electrical current to lift your skin while also massaging the facial muscles. You will often hear about new science and technology on Event Horizon, and Forio is at the forefront. The Bear Microcurrent Device by Forio is a truly brilliant groundbreaking gadget that you can get for someone you love. I've used the Bear Device by Forio, which is the world's first FDA cleared medical microcurrent device with an anti shock system, and it really does a brilliant job at visibly improving signs of aging by providing a gentle firming of the over 60 muscles in the face and neck. If you're looking for a gift for a loved one, look no further. Check out the link in the description box to get 21% off. David Kipping, welcome back to the program. It is always a pleasure to be back on here. Thanks for having me. David, I, I cannot stop thinking about the possibility of exomoons, and you now have a second candidate. Tell us about the progress in the field of detecting an exomoon. Yeah, exomoons is obviously my lifelong passion as a professional astronomer, probably even before then, inspired by science fiction. And I think we all, it seems obvious that if there are so many moons in our own solar system, that they should be out there. But you know, the, re the reason why we're doing this is not to prove yes or no, do they exist? It's to look for them and understand them, measure their properties, understand our own uniqueness. How special or non-special is our own solar system? Are we ourselves? Of course, we have such a large moon. It's always been a question, is that common? Or is there something special about our own home? So these are the kind of questions we've always been trying to address. Now we had this mission, Kepler, that NASA launched over a decade ago now. It searched for four and a half years, looking at one patch of the sky. It got a second life after that, but its main mission was for about four and a half years, looking at one patch of the sky, looking for planets. And of course, as many people listening might know, it was extraordinarily successful. It discovered thousands, over 4,000 planets in that field. Some of the planets were very small. They were smaller even than the Earth. So that gave us some hope that perhaps we could use that same data to look for not just the planets as they pass in front of their star, block out some starlight, that's what we call a transit. But if there was a moon, we could also detect the moons around them as well. So we've been trying very hard with Kepler data to do that. And we've squeezed that data in my team, especially for years now. Of all of that effort, there are really just two, maybe two and a half candidates that, <laughs> that emerged from this years and years of effort. One of them is Kepler 1625. We had a hint of that in the Kepler data. We then got Hubble Space Telescope time to pursue it and we saw in the Hubble data is really where the huge signal appeared. We saw this evidence for a Neptune-sized moon. Sounds bizarre to say that, but a Neptune-sized moon orbiting a super Jupiter. So kind of like a, a scaled up version of the Earth-Moon system, really, but multiply it by a factor of 10 in terms of the physical dimensions in all sense. And when you get to a system like that, of course, it's going to be a lot of skepticism about whether such a thing is real, even though the data showed it quite convincingly. It was recovered by three independent teams, the actual wobble of the planet that we look for to try and find these moons. And then there was also a dip associated with that moon as it passed in front of the star. That was recovered by two out of three teams as well. So we had good confidence it was there, but it wasn't enough to say, hey, we're done. This is a slam dunk discovery. You know, science is a process of internal skepticism. We want to always dot our I's, cross our T's before we really believe something. And so we wanted to go back and observe it again. And very unfortunately, I don't really have a good explanation for it, we've not been able to get time on Hubble or JWST to pursue that target. So that's been very frustrating, as you can imagine, with this kind of uncertainty about it. 
And then on top of that, we found another candidate a couple of years later. So I guess this was maybe a year and a year and a half ago now that we called Kepler 1708b. This again was a similar type of planet, a Jupiter-like planet around a sun-like star, very long orbital period, kind of similar to the Earth around the sun, in fact, even a little bit further out than that. And again, we saw evidence of a dip, a dip that appeared consistent, and this time with a mini Neptune. So again, a big moon, a freakishly big moon. In both cases, it's probably not surprising if these things were real, it's probably not surprising they are as big as they are, because think about the discovery of hot Jupiters if you go back in time, sort of 20 years, hot Jupiters are a very unusual and rare type of planet in the universe. Only 1% of stars have hot Jupiters. These are Jupiter-sized planets, which have somehow migrated in. So they're orbiting 20 times closer to their star than the Earth orbits around the sun. So this is closer even than Mercury orbits around our sun. These are very, very close in planets. Nobody expected to find them, but Lo and behold, we started finding many, many of them, and that wasn't particularly surprising because they're so easy to detect. And so that's often the way it is with astronomy. It's not often that you discover necessarily the most likely thing first, but the thing which is loudest. You know, it's like the person who screams loudest at the party. There's not very many people who go around a party screaming, but you're probably going to notice them first because they're so loud. It's maybe the same way with SETI. I think a lot. Maybe there's things with the way we look for life that may be the same. It's not that the the civilizations are particularly typical, but they may be the, the you know the, the crazy ones in the room that are just yelling their head off. They're the ones we're most likely to hear from. And so in the same way with planets, that was the first type of planet we found. These moons are very weird, but again, it's maybe not that surprising because they're gonna obviously be the most easiest ones to find, these large moons. So again, we've been trying to pursue those. It's been very difficult. The last update I can really give you is that in the last JWST cycle, so the James Webb Space Telescope, which is by far the most powerful telescope we have at the moment to look for this. That telescope is incredible. The data is so phenomenal. It turns out, and we showed this through extensive simulations, that that telescope is the only machine humanity has ever built which is capable of finding the moons we have in our own backyard. I'm talking about the moon, I'm talking about Europa, Enceladus, Ganymede, Callisto, things like this. Those types of moons are eminently detectable around known exoplanets with JWST. And around planets which we know are Jupiter-like. So you know, take the most Jupiter-like planet you can find in the Kepler catalog. We've actually got dozens of those things. You simulate the type of moons they'd form using the same moon models we make moons in our own backyard, or at least we think is how the moon's formed. And JWST could detect them. And yet, frustratingly, we weren't able to get time. And so I talked about that on my YouTube channel. There was as a frustration, I've been public about that, that I think is strategically the wrong thing to do. But I have to respect the decision of the committee at that time, and of course, we will try again. An Exo Callisto detecting that would be amazing. So, once you do detect an Exo Moon, which personally I'm sure they're there, I mean, our, our solar system is full of moons. Once you detect one, is there any chance of characterizing it? In other words, can you infer that this thing is like Callisto and basically an almost atmosphere? spherically absent rock, or could you detect a Titan where you actually have something going on? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's just recently this last week, there's been recoveries of or attempts to recover the atmosphere of Trappist one's planets using JWST. So Trappist one is this very famous planetary system because it has seven Earth sized, in fact, even slightly smaller than the Earth planets in a very, very compact orbit. So it's like the seven dwarfs almost orbiting this very small red dwarf star. Very famous system, huge amounts of interest in it. Several of the planets are in the habitable zone. And we have now used JWST to look at the innermost planet and the second innermost planet, B and C, as they're called. And we can tell there's no atmosphere there. And that's using JWST and the transit method. Basically, you look at the transits and you just see. Do those transits appear to be the same shape, the same depth, we would say, in every single color or spectrum wavelength of light? So we look at it in red light, we look at it in blue light. In fact, you know, JWST is really looking at infrared light, but it's essentially splitting the light up into different wavelengths. 
And if there really was an atmosphere, you'd expect to see a difference. I mean, our sky is blue. And so an alien looking at our sky would see that Earth would look slightly bigger in blue light than red light because the Earth's atmosphere scatters blue light. That's why we have a blue sky. And so it's that kind of signal that we're looking for that would prove, hey, there's, there must be an atmosphere there to explain this. A solid structure does not do that. You know, pure, That's why with Boyajin star, we felt convinced it was probably dust or something that was explaining the mysterious dips that we saw in front of that star, these very peculiar dips that at one point were hypothesized to be an alien megastructure. But again, a solid structure with no atmosphere, presumably, would look the same in every wavelength. And we we didn't, you know, that's exactly what we saw for these planets. It looks like a, a purely solid thing. But with Boyajin star, you saw wavelength differences, very strong wavelength differences, which implied there was some kind of small particulates that were in fact responsible rather than a solid structure. So yeah, we can do the same thing for exomoons. If we can do this for TRAPPIST-1b and TRAPPIST-1c, I mean, it depends on the target, how far away the star is, how bright the star is, things like this. But in principle, the capability is there. But it will certainly depend on how observable, let's say, the, the exo Callisto will be that we find. Now, with the TRAPPIST system, with the, the findings with the two innermost worlds being atmosphereless, do you think that that makes, or do you think we're starting to get a case that red dwarfs might be non-ideal stars to be next to that strip the atmospheres from their planets. I mean, I've been thinking that for a long time, as maybe we've talked about before. I've been deeply suspicious about the suitability of m dwarfs for having life or even atmospheres, and thus they can't have life as a result of that. So yeah, they are very energetic, especially, I mean, the main problem with m dwarfs is, some listeners might know, they live far, far longer than sun-like stars. Our own sun will only live for about 10 billion years in total. So it's like another four or five billion years to go. Whereas red dwarfs, they can live in some cases for up to a trillion years or even longer than that. And so a way to think about it with M dwarfs is they do everything in slow motion, everything. And that includes their whole life, but also their adolescence. So our sun is a mature star. It's like a middle-aged star. It's calmed down. It's very quiet. It's quiescent. And that's good for us. It's good for agriculture and advanced technology and for our atmosphere. But M dwarfs, they're still, essentially, because the universe is 13 billion years old, from an M-Dwarf's perspective, the universe is extremely young. And so it is itself a, still an adolescent star. So it is highly active. It is flaring a lot. It's producing huge amounts of energy, ultraviolet radiation, X-ray radiation. And that um, can strip the atmosphere and eventually lead to complete erosion. And so even if you have surface liquid water, that surface liquid water then sublimate away. It gets very difficult to imagine life as we know it, at least surviving and being detectable in those, in those kinds of conditions. So I've, I've been concerned about that for a long time. And one of the reasons I was concerned about it was not just the stars themselves. I've sort of studied those stars in the past, especially Proxima Centauri, which is the nearest such example. Just the curiosity of the fact. So here, let me give you three facts about M dwarfs. As I said, they live far, far longer than any other type of star. They live for trillions of years. They are far more numerous than any other type of star. 75% of all stars in the universe are red dwarf stars. And not only that, but from Kepler statistics and from Tess statistics, they appear to more often have Earth-sized planets in the habitable zones of their stars, or the, or the nominal habitable zone. So they have everything going for them. And in fact, if you add up these three things, you end up with like 100 to 1 odds that if you were to be born a random civilization or a random soul almost somewhere in the universe, you are much more likely by a hundred factor of 100 to 1 to be born with an M dwarf in your sky than a yellow dwarf star or really a white dwarf star as, as we, we don't call it white dwarf because that means something else, but to us it does look white from space. So this is kind of a confusing fact, but one easy resolution is just to say M dwarfs in fact aren't truly habitable. That's the resolution, that there's something about them that prevents them or at least maybe it prevents them at this point in the universe's history from producing intelligence or even just simple life. So I've been concerned about that for a long time, and certainly these couple of results we're getting point in that direction, but it remains an unproven hypothesis. It's very difficult to, I mean, it's very difficult to disprove life on a planet, right? It's, it's unfalsifiable almost in some senses, and that's a big challenge in, in life searching. But there are indications that this may not be the place that we hoped uh, in terms of being a hospitable place for life. Can we go so far as to think in terms of exo and solidus? In other words, if red dwarfs can't work surface life, can you have that situation where you have a uh, liquid water ocean underneath ice 
shielding the life from the fury of the red dwarf. I mean, this is, again, this is really unfalsifiable, but we'll probably never know. But the question is, is that does an ice shell moon scenario like Europa or Enceladus orbiting a planet in a red dwarf system change this? Possibly. I think there's a couple of yeah advantages moons could have in that sense. Uh, one is that, yeah, if they're protected by an ice shell and there's an internal source of heat, which certainly we see in, uh, in our own solar system for Jupiter and its moons, and even Saturn to some degree, then you could imagine life sustaining. A big problem M dwarfs have is that they rarely have giant planets. Jupiters are very, very unusual around these small stars, which maybe makes sense, right? If you start off with less mass to begin with, Jupiter's a big planet, there's less stuff around to build big planets in the first place. They do sometimes happen, but they're very infrequent compared to sun-like stars. So that's an obvious challenge. Second, on top of that, I guess it might be detectable because you know we, we see Enceladus has these plumes, and Europa too, where you know you can get these jets of material which come out from beneath the surface. And if we are very fortuitous, those jets of material might create a transit signal, and we might be able to sample spectroscopically what is inside the water remotely. I've never seen a calculation of how detectable that would be, but that would be an interesting, you know, in principle, it, it could be testable. And the other advantage that moons have is that they don't get tidally locked to their star. So you probably know that our own moon is tidally locked to our Earth, so we always see the same side of it. And it's thought for these M dwarfs, because the planets end up so close to them, that especially within the haplozone, zone, all of the planets end up tidally locked to the star. So you have one side of the planet being baked in perpetual light and heat, and the other side's basically frozen out. And this can also be a big concern. Maybe that leads to atmospheric collapse. The night side could get so cold, the atmosphere solidifies. And then once that happens, there from the warm side rushes over, it cools down, it solidifies, you have total atmospheric collapse. So that's always been a concern with these dwarf planets. That will not be a concern for moons, despite what Pink Floyd might have told you. <laughs> There's no such thing as the dark side of a moon. A moon can never, even if it's tidally locked to the Earth, which our moon is, it still has a varying night side and day side. It's not always on the same side. And so if that wasn't true, then there'd be no such thing as a new moon phase, right? The, that's when you're seeing a new moon phase, the far side of the moon is in full illumination. And that's exactly what's happening. So in that sense, a moon could have some advantages. But again, I think there are some challenges there. Uh, it's still going to be susceptible to the same kind of questions about frequency as to how often you can get this configuration. These systems tend to be very compact, certainly for TRAPPIST-1, which we talked about before. It has been shown rigorously that the planets are so close together they're so close, it's such a tightly patched system, there is literally no space for moons. If you put a moon in there, it just couldn't survive because the planets would just like fight over the moon and the moon would be destabilized essentially gravitationally. So if that's a common architecture of these types of end dwarfs, which actually seems some indications that's so, then there just may not be any moons period in these kinds of very, very infrequently around these types of systems. And so there's lots and lots we don't know, but some, some warning shots that could be concerning about the existence of life around those types of stars. So the far side of the moon would not have been as effective of an album title as the dark side of the moon. <laughs> that said, I think that we might be saying, I mean, could, is this right to say this, that maybe our solar system is rare specifically because it has moons? That That's a possibility. And that's something we can observationally test. I mean, this is what uh, I found so frustrating with the my recent experience with these JWST proposals. We could show that the very same models that we understand the formation of not just Jupiter's moons, but Saturn's moons, both of those moon systems are basically fully explained with basically this idea of a gas-starved disk. So when the planet first formed, it had a disk of material around it. The gas was sort of blown off by stellar winds and you had kind of this dusty disk. And that from that dust and ice, you started to accumulate the satellitesimals, as they're called, the cores of satellites that eventually went on to form the moons as we know them today. And so it's a very well understood theory in terms of what explains so many things in terms of the architecture of our own moons. And so it's obvious to take that theory then, which works at least in two cases, and actually works to some degree for Uranus and Neptune as well, and ask, well, surely this must happen for other Jupiter-sized planets as well. And if so, what type of moons would you expect? And if those moons were really out there, how long would they last for, given all the gravitational interactions and tides and things like this? And then further, how, how detectable would those moons be? And so we did that experiment, and we found of the 4,500 exoplanets that we know about, there was basically half a dozen 
that JWST could find those types of moons. Not very many, right? So we're using the absolute cutting state-of-the-art telescope, JWST, and there's only basically six or seven known exoplanets that are Jupiter-like, that should have Jupiter-like moons, and JWST could unambiguously detect those Jupiter-like moons. And so we felt this was a great idea. We, we should survey these six planets. They're very, they very rarely transit. I mean, think about Jupiter, it goes around the sun once every five years. So it's, uh, fact, is it 11 years? Uh, so it goes around very infrequently. And these types of planets we were looking at, I think there were like typically periods of one to three years, typically. And so, you know, you might not even, you might not get it this cycle and you have to wait three years before JWST can observe it again. And look, JWST won't be around forever. It will eventually run out of fuel and coolant. We don't know how exactly how long that'll be. It could be five years nominally was the expected lifetime, but now it's looking more like maybe 10 or even 20. But in any case, it will eventually die. And I think we will absolutely kick ourselves if we never, in the history of its life, even attempt to ask the question, are, are, the, are, you know, are there moons around other Jupiter-like planets out there? It would just be unthinkable to me that we don't do that experiment. So yeah, it was a very frustrating experience because they're so infrequent. Every time we miss one of these, we're having to wait years to do it again. So that was, that was a challenge, and I, I hope in the next cycle, the deadline's in October, so we're sort of getting ready, gearing up now to propose again. We, in October, we have, yeah, I said there were six or seven planets, and number one, the absolute best one, I'm not going to give away its name, but it's number, the number one absolute best planet that we could detect moons for is coming up in the next cycle. If we, if we don't get the time for that, I'm, I don't know what to do. I'm going to eat my hat or something because the case is so unbelievably strong that it, it would be just bizarre to me if we don't even attempt to do this experiment. To drive this home, one of the solutions to the Fermi paradox is lack of moon. In other words, life on Earth is somewhat dependent on the presence of a moon. And if it turns out that exomoons are rare, that could be a solution to the paradox, or if you want to call it a paradox, but it would be a solution to that, that you need a moon in the right circumstances. So this bears an especially hefty factor right. as to whether there is life in the universe or not, at least above the microbial scale. So what is your views on lack of exomoons as a solution? I mean, I think I think the the days are still too early to call that viable. I think, well, there almost certainly are, there has to be moons out there to some degree. I, for me, it's never been a question of do moons exist, but really what are their character? How often do they appear? What typical sizes do they get up to? We look at the history of exoplanets and it was a, a story of surprises, as we've talked about before. Just, you know, we found circumbinary planets like Tatooine from Star Wars. We found planets in extreme eccentric orbits, tilted over planets, things like Trappist One, like seven planets all orbiting within the orbit of Venus, like extremely compact orbits. So every time we've discovered something in exoplanets, it has generally been against what we expected. And I think we should expect something similar with exomoons. And so we can hopefully anticipate a very profound revolution in our understanding of planetary system formation in the same way exoplanets has completely torn up the textbook about how we thought, we thought everything would look like the solar system. And the solar system is in, in fact an incredibly unusual outcome. And so, yeah, maybe it is so that there's something special about the way that moons form and that would have some interesting implications. But what I love about this hypothesis, is we can actually just go around and test it. If JWST looks at five or six of these things and we don't find anything, and we know it could find it, should those moons exist, then we're done. We can, or at least we have a, a strong indication that moons are indeed a rare phenomena. Large moons are a rare phenomena. There could always be something even smaller that JWST can't see, but the kind of moons, that, you know, the famous moons in our solar system would be rare. That's possible. I think the more, so it might be an explanation perhaps for the Fermi paradox, I can think of a less speculative reason for doing this science to convince skeptics as to why we should do this. And that would be if we ever want to directly image an Earth-like planet, take a photo of it, which is kind of the ultimate dream of exoplanets. And we're already making great inroads towards that. We're taking photos of young Jupiter-like planets, even young Neptune-like planets in the, in the process of forming very far from their star. And we want to one day build a telescope which can image true Earth analogs. Now the problem with that is the question of the moons. When we get this image, as formidable as the technology and the resolution of that telescope will one day be, it's not feasibly ever going to be capable of resolving the moon and the earth in that image. You will get one blob of light, one pale 
blue blob, but actually it'll be a pale blue and gray blob because of the light of the moon will mix with the light of the earth. And there will be no way to resolve that with even our most ambitious ideas of how we would construct these telescopes. So that raises a problem because the problem is we would like to look for things like biosignatures, the signature of oxygen in the light of that pale blue blob. And we would also like to look for techno signatures, you know, CFCs, for instance, as a way of looking for a civilization, pollution in their atmosphere. And all of that will depend on taking that pale blue blob, or Sagan would say a dot, <laughs> saying blob maybe less poetically, and splitting up the light into its spectrum and looking for what we'd normally call a chemical disequilibria, which basically means stuff which shouldn't be there. Normally, you know, if you have two chemicals, oxygen and methane, that are both present in that atmosphere, there's no way those two chemicals play nice together without life being present. Something has to be making them. Oxygen and methane will just always react together. So something must be manufacturing these on an active process, which means essentially biology, as far as we can tell, must be present. However, if, if in fact it is not a single planet, but it is a Titan, which has a very methane-rich atmosphere, and it is a Earth that never got life going, but it was very water-rich, and that water, even more water than we currently have. And that water will evaporate, it will photolysize in the atmosphere, which means it splits up the H2O, splits up into oxygen and hydrogen. And then you would have the signature of an oxygen-rich atmosphere from the Earth and a methane-rich atmosphere from the Titan-like moon. But you would not know there were two bodies there. You would think you were looking at one and you would erroneously conclude you had detected life. But all along, it was just a moon that tricked you. So I would claim that we are never gonna be able to truly get to this great goal, this great ambition of understanding our uniqueness and the search for life and biosignatures and pale blue dots. We're never gonna to get to those ambitions unless we understand the moon question. If we conclude from JWST that indeed Earth-like moons are incredibly rare, then we could probably discount the story I just told you. We could probably say that's, that's I mean, we can quantify it. It's a less than 0.1% probability. And so if we get a few signals like that, we could be fairly confident that these are indeed real and life is out there. But if we never quantify this number, we'll never know. We'll just be perennially stuck. And that would be incredibly frustrating. So again, I think whilst JWST is flying, it won't fly forever. We have to do this experiment. Otherwise, we will never be able to make progress in this question. I think it's an interesting thought to reverse this because you could say that we very well may be someone else's pale blue blob that they're endlessly debating on whether it could have life or not. Yeah. And they're looking at Earth. Now, constraints on telescopes. Say we have unlimited resources and we can build an enormous telescope the size of New York or something like that if that's physically possible without it collapsing on itself. Can we ever in the far future build a telescope large enough to do better than this and actually answer these questions and separate the signal out from the moon versus its planet? Indeed, yeah. There, there are certainly telescopes we can imagine that could potentially do everything all at once. So what I described to you is, is really a two-prong approach. JWST asks the question, how often are moon-like moons around Earth-like planets? And you, you get a statistical answer to that question. Part two, completely separate, you have a different telescope that images these pale blue dots, probably even different pale blue dots. And then we apply that statistical understanding to assess the, the occurrence rate of false positives, essentially, for these tricks of light. But it'd be great if we could just have one telescope which could do everything. But that really requires somehow detecting the moon within that pale blue dot. Now there is some hope of potentially doing that. If you could have very high resolution spectra of that pale blue dot, then what you may be able to see is essentially the same technique that we look for exoplanets around wobbling stars. So this is called radial velocity. As the star moves back and forth in reflex motion in response to the planet, you can see the lines, the spectral lines slightly shift like an ambulance pitch, you know, very famously getting higher pitch when it comes towards you, lower pitch as it drives away, you would see the same thing in the spectrum. And so we could do potentially the same thing for this pale blue dot and see the planet is not only moving around the star, but on top of that has a little back and forth, which is due to a moon. And so we could do radial velocity of the planet itself. This is not something which any currently designed telescopes could feasibly do for an Earth analog. 
one of the great challenges of doing this is that you know when we typically design these telescopes it's really really difficult to separate the light of an earth from the light of a star i mean the the sun is a billion times brighter than the earth a billion times brighter so you have to suppress you have to have a suppression system that operates at a better than a billion to one precision that's incredibly challenging and so these these systems tend to be very bespoke and wavelength specific so they tend to work at more or less just one or a very small wavelength range because you have to design all of your optics to optimize that particular wavelength but as a cost of that it means you can't do the kind of experiment i just described where you have you can look across the broad wavelength range and see the lines going back and forth and do that kind of experiment or at least you you suppress your ability to do that kind of experiment it is potentially possible, but it's certainly not something we have on the drawing lines. But you know, the way it is with with astronomy, almost everything's possible. Everything's possible, <laughs> but if you if you have enough uh, uh, resources, my, one of the funnest papers I ever saw was by Jean Schneider, and he he asked, you know, if you like, you took your experiment, John, would be take the most extreme telescope you could possibly imagine, like a super advanced civilization might have, and that really equates to a telescope which is the size of a sun. And there's a way of doing that using the gravitational lensing of the sun. So this is called the, the solar telescope or the gravitational focus telescope. And at this point, which would be a focus point, which is on the outskirts of the solar system. So we're talking sort of the distance where planet nine would be, sort of hundreds of AU, over a thousand AU away from the sun. At this point, you could build a small telescope, which would be able to use the focusing power of the sun and have a huge collecting area. And so Jean Schneider asked, what could you do with that telescope? If you looked at the nearest exoplanet, could you actually image inhabitants? Could you see a creature, roughly our size, one meter, walking across the surface of that planet? How challenging would this be? And the basic conclusion was no. Even with a sun-sized telescope for the nearest star, they just you're so photon starved. There are so there are so few photons per second that make that journey from reflecting off your body and traveling those many, many light years to reach the telescope, even a sun sized telescope, that it's just you end up with like one photon per year or something reaching the telescope. And so it's just it's impossible. You could never see motion because of course you're moving way too much, much faster than that scale. So unfortunately, if we ever want to do that kind of stuff, it's it is possible, but it means we have to visit it. There's only so far remote observations can ever take us. If we really want to go all the way, at the end of the day, you have to actually visit these star systems. The universe is a harsh mistress as far as light goes. Now, you authored a paper relatively recently with the late Bob Gray on picking up the wow signal again, because this answers the whole question. If you pick up technological signals, then you don't really have to look for biosignatures. You know they're there. So what did you determine as far as ever trying to pick up the wow signal again? Can we do it? And can we reasonably say that it was a fluke and determine that it was just a one-off? I mean, statistically speaking, how do you do that? Yeah, this, this was a paper that I wanted to write for a long time because the wow signal, it's, I guess, not to the extent of obviously Robert Gray was haunted by it. But it's always been one of the most intriguing things in, in science, right? I mean, you, you can go down a very deep rabbit hole reading on, you know, I love going into Wikipedia articles and reading all about these like strange anomalies, strange things that were discovered. And the wow signal for me sticks out as one of those most fascinating historical discoveries. So Bob Gray was the wow guy, really. He, he spent more time than anybody trying to understand that signal looking for repetitions of it. He even built his own backyard radio telescope to pursue that. I was always intrigued from it from a statistical perspective. It was a one-off. And so a lot of my work in terms of statistics has focused on the question of black swans, rare, unusual events. A lot of my colleagues are drawn towards big data where you have thousands, millions, billions of data points. You can train these huge machine learning models and you can learn so much about them. I've always been drawn to the case where you have one data point because <laughs> that's where you have to be intellectually so much more careful. When you have lots of data, it's easy. The data actually drives you towards the solution quite, quite trivially. When you have a single data point, the way you set up the problem even has influence on the kind of results that you get out. So I have always enjoyed those problems. The wow signal epitomized that for me. And so I just asked the question with Bob. We asked, given all the work that's been done so far on the wow signal, what does this does this mean that we can you know despite many many attempts to 
look for it over the many years, does this mean that we can conclude that it's absolutely ruled out? And uh, it turns out, you know, not so much. I mean, typically we would want to reach a confidence threshold of, you know, we sometimes use the phrase sigmas. The Higgs boson, for instance, was detected to five sigma confidence. Astronomers sometimes would be more okay with three sigma. Maybe a three sigma detection is okay. Certainly if you're at one or two sigma, nobody's going to believe you. And so what would it take to exclude the hypothesis that WOW will repeat at that minimum level of three sigma confidence? And we're not there yet. The amount of data that has been collected does not allow us to exclude that hypothesis at a three sigma level. And so we suggested, or calculated in that paper, that it would take about another 62 days of accumulated observation. So you're not going to be able to literally get that in, in two months on, in, in terms of the calendar time because you can't observe all the time. But presumably, I think you could probably, if within a very aggressive campaign, get to that level of sensitivity in about a year worth, a year's worth of obs observing. And so to me, that seems worthwhile doing. Who wants to have a perpetual mystery. That's, that's the most frustrating thing to a scientist. We would either rather know the answer is no. That's how I feel about exomoons. I'd either rather know there's no exomoon there and we're done and we can move on, stop wasting our mental effort on that target. Or yes, there is something there. And then of course, that's an incredible discovery in of itself. But there's nothing more frustrating than being stuck at that no man's land. Uh, the gray territory to use Robert Gray's last name. And that's kind of where we're stuck. The way our signal is gray. And so I wanted to ask the question, what would it take to, to, to resolve that? So I think there's two compelling things from it. One is we're not done. There's still ambiguity, despite the many, many hours. There's, I think, been over 100 or 200 hours of subsequent observations on that target. But 200 hours is still not enough, and we need probably thousands of hours, which means about 60 days worth of continuous observations to really get us to that point where we can say, Look, the wow signal, whatever it was, it was not coming from that star as a, what we call a stochastic repeater, which basically means like a, a repeater which randomly occurs in time. There's no sort of obvious pattern to its behavior. And certainly Bob had before that put m even much stronger limits on periodic repeaters. So what if it repeated like once every 24 hours exactly? Or what if it repeated once every 10 days every exactly? Or whatever number you choose. And there's very, very strong limits on strictly periodic repeaters. But of course, there's no reason why an alien would necessarily choose to do that. They might choose a random firing pattern because in fact, that in many ways makes it easier to detect if it's random. You're not likely to get caught in sort of these. If they chose exactly 24 hours and it just happened to line up with when the Earth was pointed at the other direction to the target, then we would never detect it because we'd always be looking in the wrong direction, at least from that particular site. So it doesn't really, I think there's reasons why you might not as a transmitter want to use a strictly periodic signal because there's chances of it being missed depending on the biology and the society which you're assuming is going to receive that signal a, a random transmitter has some benefits in that sense so still more work to be done i hope somebody does it and i was excited to to show that you know the wow signal still just about lives if we had a billionaire we might be able to fund a such a search and one of the selling points of the big ear telescope that picked up the wow signal in the first place was that it was cheap. It was cheap radio astronomy. A Krausian style telescope like that isn't that expensive to build. And it seems to me that if we had a billionaire, it might be worth taking a look with another such telescope with a better receiver. You know, it's not 1977 anymore. Mm. I think that thing had like 50 channels, whereas now we have billions, you know, <laughs> available with receivers. Mm -hmm. So could you recreate with a billionaire the Big Ear Telescope on the cheap? And could you look for the wow signal that way with a telescope that's non-steerable and rotating with the Earth over a course of, say, three years and knock it out if you don't hear anything? I mean, could you use this method today to build a radio telescope specifically designed to look and see if the wow signal repeats? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you're offering, John, I'll take that. <laughs> I'm not sure if you're a billionaire, but we would happily take that uh, that opportunity. I guess the challenge is that that's a lot of infrastructure to build. I actually don't think it's necessary to build a dedicated telescope to it because they already exist, or at least there's plenty of radio telescopes which could already do this. And you can look at the model of Breakthrough Listen. They didn't, you know, this is a $100 million radio SETI project being funded by a billionaire, Yuri Milner. And so in that case, they didn't build a new telescope, but instead they bought telescope time 
on the Parkes radio telescope in Australia. So that's a, an alternative way of doing it and much cheaper. You're kind of renting the time rather than buying the time. And I think that I'm not sure how Breakthrough Listen think about the wow signal. They probably are more interested in doing a systematic survey, I think, of the whole sky rather than dedicating too much effort on any one particular target. But, uh, I, you know, as I said, I, I would definitely pitch that to them that I think just the sense of ambiguity with any target like this. And it's not just the wow, there's actually several others now since then that have been found using artificial intelligence methods, actually going back through even Breakthrough Listen's own data. There are other wow-like signals that exist, probably not to the same kind of scrutiny and subsequent observations that wow has enjoyed. And I certainly haven't analyzed any of those, but uh, I think there are several of them. And whenever you've got that ambiguity, I mean, what are we going to do? Is our plan just to go around detecting ambiguous signals and, and then move on and not look at them again? I think we ha why don't we just nail them out and just figure out what's going on with them? And then at least we can exclude them and move on. And probably through that process, we'll understand the source of these false positives better in the first place. But it's, uh, it's just, I've never liked ambiguity. And so to me, it just seems like an obvious, not only a scientifically interesting case to figure out what really is going on with this star, or really, we don't even know the star, but it's a field. But what possible explanations could there be? And I think we would probably gain a, a lot of insight from that. I guess the only unfortunate thing is we can't go back in time. I mean, this was a signal from 1977. There were far few satellites in orbit of the Earth back then. And so that's what makes it so interesting. The signal lasted for 72 seconds, right? At least 72 seconds. And so that means it was on the whole time. That's actually a long time. And most low Earth orbit satellites would create signals for less than a second or just a few seconds because they move around the Earth so quickly. So it's very difficult to explain how you get a persistent signal for 72 seconds in a radio band, which, as you know, is, is in the waterline at 1420 megahertz, which is prohibited for anyone to use except for astronomers. And of course, you know, Everyone could say, well, maybe there was a, a, a wide spy satellite or something in a kind of crazy wide orbit that was moving very slowly and they were using this channel. But I've never been satisfied with that because astronomers are paying so much attention to this radio channel that why would you transmit your secret messages on the most observed radio channel in all of astronomy? It, it doesn't really make any sense to me that you would, you would coincidentally choose that exact same frequency <laughs> as, as, as the one that we, we put so much effort into looking at. So I've never been satisfied with that explanation. So I, I, I am skeptical of it being, at least there's something that doesn't make sense about the satellite hypothesis. And yet at the same time, if you exclude that, you're basically done. And you would have to conclude that this looks very convincing, like a genuine astrophysical signal. Yeah, the, the, you have to bear in mind that it was 1977. So yeah, there are things like Molniya orbits and things like that that might produce a signal. But the thing is, is that I can't imagine that the Soviet Union or whoever would put such a satellite up there at that time would tell the world's radio astronomers on a silent channel <laughs> that it exists. So it doesn't really make sense. Right. In regards to techno signatures, though, there's another one, another anomaly. And I don't know if you've ever run across it. And it's Shabilsky Star, HD 101065, I believe, that seems to have transuranic elements in its spectrum. So Mm. Would that be a better target to look at one of the other weird signals as opposed to wow? Do you think that could we defeat ambiguity that way by looking at a star with a really strange composition? Yeah, I, I really like that idea. I guess, you know, the idea of a tennis signature has broadened out. When we were doing Radio SETI back in the 70s, we, I mean, I wasn't involved, it was before I was born. But as astronomers, when we were doing that, that was really the only way that we thought of looking for life in the universe or thought that you know that we had a chance of being successful these days we have this broad approach that considers everything from like what we might call salting the star in that case sort of dropping elements into the star that really shouldn't be there and we can spectroscopically detect those and then that gives us a hint it's a it's a significant you have to kind of maybe question the effort level that that's a significant amount of effort you have to put a lot of throw a huge amount of heavy metals into the star and there's no message there. It's just a beacon, right? There's just some, all you're hoping is that someone would detect this anomalous thing. Maybe that's a cue. Maybe there's something around that star that we can look at in more detail and detect something with more information. Maybe it was even just an accident. You know, some civilization did some crazy science experiment that, <laughs> that ended up <laughs> crashing a planet into a star or something. I don't know. But um, it's certainly a little bit ambiguous, that type of techno signature. The thing with potentially, 
it wasn't true for WoW, but potentially with a WoW-like signal or a radio signal, is that it could be completely unambiguous. And it's very rare in any search for life that you have that. But certainly most biosignatures will not enjoy that. Imagine, I'm sure you've seen Contact, or read the book as well, there's that, you know, an in-depth message encoded within it. And so at that point, once you start to do video decoding, there's like thousands of lines of binary code in there, then there's, there's absolutely no doubt that this is artificial. I mean, already with the radio signal, it's pretty much impossible. We don't have any natural process of producing a narrow band signal as narrow as the one that WoW had. Uh, you, there's no known astrophysical process. Despite the you know, almost 50 years that have passed since the WoW signal was detected, we still don't know of any astrophysical process that could possibly produce such a narrow band signal. That's always been one of the great appeals, is that the only thing we know in the universe that can do that is a radio transmitter. Now, what about salting? Certainly, we do not know of a way of salting a star, but we have to admit that our understanding of uh, stars and astrophysical phenomena more generally is still emerging, it's still growing. And this is maybe a case where, you know, we still aren't 100% sure about the origin of all the elements. A fairly recent innovation has been the collision of neutron stars being detected by LIGO has been a big boon for the idea that many of the heavy elements, such as gold, for instance, are actually forged in these neutron called uh, ca these kind of neutron capture processes and uh, the d the detection of neutron stars colliding into each other is pretty much convincing evidence that this is indeed a channel through which these heavy metals are forming but that's very recent so just in the last few years our understanding of how the elements are, f are being forged in our body and on our planet is evolving and so it may very well be there is a very high energy astrophysical process maybe you know some kind of hypernova event or whatever you want to call it that occurred nearby that star that somehow enriched its surface with these elements that is that's always on the table and so the great challenge with techno signatures is it's not enough to detect just something which is anomalous and i think this is true in all reigns everything from ufos all the way to a fossil on Mars. I mean, think about Bill Clinton on the White House lawn with the Alan Hills meteorite. And there was this anomalous thing, right? That he could, you could hold, he wasn't holding it in his hand, but you could hold it in your hand. This like weird worm-like fossil-like thing that was found in that rock. And it was anomalous. We didn't know of any process that could produce that. But then a couple of years later, for very soon after, I think it was even sooner than that, geologists realized, well, maybe this could actually form through water. You know, you can have water flowing over the surface and in certain configurations, it can actually create minerals that look kind of like this. And so actually, maybe it's not a, a real fossil after all. It's possibly just a natural formation, where the process of water and rock interacting. So that's the great challenge with everything we do in techno signatures is how do we know what we are looking at has no alternative explanation at all. And I think the great appeal of Radio SETI for all of its long history of not having any success, it has always the great appeal of being potentially able to deliver that slam dunk. And that's that's what I always want personally. I don't want to live in, in, in ambiguity. I want slam dunk detections. Techno signatures in another sense. Now, I think in geologic timescales. So for me, something that's going to happen in 100 million years is urgent and concerning. The sun is changing. And it is it is no red dwarf. It is not fully convective. It, it has a limited fuel no. and it's going to change. But maybe we can, through star lifting, start pulling out some of the helium ash that is collecting in the sun and prolong it or change it and make it into a more ideal star or at least a star on life support. Can we detect that from a distance? If somebody's around a type G star like ours and they're trying to prolong its life, it's a little bit further down. Could we detect star lifting for a civilization that's trying to prolong the life of their sun? Yeah, this is a great question because it's something we've been thinking a lot about in my group with my student, Matt Scoggins. And he actually presented this at a SETI conference just this week on Monday. And we have a paper out on the archive all about this. We call this idea Lazarus stars. So the idea of star lifting, it's been around for a while, but it hasn't really been worked through in terms of stellar evolution how does it how does it affect the way in which stars age one of the limiting problems with our own long future on this planet is that our sun is slowly increasing in luminosity this is not relevant to the time scales of our own human lives or climate change or anything but it, it will over millions and 
hundreds of millions of years significantly affect the climate of our planet already has done in the past and as it does so as it increases in luminosity it's already increased in luminosity by about 30 percent over its entire main sequence lifetime uh, which is actually somewhat of a puzzle we actually don't understand how the earth was even habitable it would the earth seems to have been too cold when it was first born given the low luminosity of the sun it's called the faint sun paradox uh, so there's kind of a mystery there but if you project this forward and we think we understand this very well because obviously we can study there's many many sun-like stars in our galaxy all of slightly different ages and we can study them we can characterize them so we have very good confidence that the sun is slowly increasing in luminosity over time and this will eventually push us out of the habitable zone and make the earth inhospitable to complex life such as ourselves in less than a billion years there's some debate about the exact number but it's probably around something like 900 million years from now so that's a problem. And the reason why the sun is increasing in luminosity is really because as the core inside it shrinks, gradually contracts, because it's converting hydrogen to helium, helium is denser, that increases the density of the core. And as the density of the core shrinks down, that increases the pressure and increases the temperature as well. And that leads to an increased rate of fusion. So you're basically making the engine hotter. You know, you're, you're pouring more coal into the fire. And so that's making the sun get more luminous, which is bad for us. So star lifting, you mentioned in your question, could we take the helium out? For the sun, that would be very difficult because the helium is all sunk to the bottom. So that's really far deep down in the core. So I'm not sure how you get that helium out. The only thing we really have access to is the surface, which is largely just a, an envelope. There's no fusion going on in the envelope. It's just the hydrogen gas that's basically the entourage is just uh, gravitationally bound to the core where all the good stuff is happening. But what we could do is pull off some of that hydrogen gas. And if you pull that off, if you decrease the mass of the sun, you're going to decrease its weight, which decreases the pressure that's bearing down on the core. And if you decrease the pressure, you're going to decrease the fusion rate in the core. And so that's kind of our idea. And so we calculated this in, in a, a code called MESA, which basically is like a, a 1D astrophysical model that simulates all of the hydrostatic equilibrium or the processes, the fusion rates inside the sun. And we ran this model forward and we basically slowly take off a little bit of mass. In the model, we actually don't even specify how we take off the mass. It's not really relevant. We just take off some mass somehow. There's different ideas about how to do that we could talk about, but we take off mass somehow off the surface of the sun. And it's actually not very much. You basically need to take off sort of the mass of a, a large asteroid, like Vesta or something, uh, once every century. So it's not even very much mass. So you take off that amount of mass, but over a billion years, that, that adds up very quickly. It becomes a significant amount of mass. And you drop the sun's mass by a percent or even a fraction of a percent. And that's enough to decrease the pressure and keep the sun the same luminosity. So instead of naturally increasing luminosity, which is what the sun naturally wants to do, we keep the sun stable at the same luminosity indefinitely. Now, eventually you lose this game. You can't do this forever because as you rightly point out, the helium's in the center and the helium is still building up and that still changes fundamentally the character of the core over time. And so eventually this game runs out, but it allows you to buy of order of a billion extra years for your civilization. In fact, in some cases, much more than that, up to a trillion years for the very small mass stars. But for our sun, we should get of order of one to two billion years extra time if we start implementing this. It doesn't even have to be like today. We could implement this in like a thousand years and that would still be basically nothing compared to the lifetime of the sun. So we could implement this and buy future generations a billion years of extra habitability. So is it something we could look for? Absolutely. So that's actually kind of the project we're working on now in my team. And Matt's doing these calculations as a follow-up paper. And yeah, so basically for if a civilization has been doing this for a long time, the star for a given mass and a given age has a very anomalous luminosity because the longer you do this for, the more it diverts from its natural track. It's kind of like you're doing genetic engineering or something, but you're, you do it every year. And so the, the fundamental properties of the star divert ever more from any of the natural tracks which, which stars are supposed to follow. And the deviation can be actually quite significant. Many factors in luminosity can even deviate by for the old, very oldest stars. So this is something we're pretty interested in looking for. And with Gaia data, you have connections of a billion stars with the kind of information we need. So our plan is to work through the, the observational signature and then actually implement it 
and go through the Gaia data and see does anything stand out as potentially a star lifting candidate. And what would be particularly exciting, John, would be if there wasn't just one, but but a collection in the same location, right? So if if we were going to do this to our sun, we might one day spread out to Alpha Centauri, to Tau Ceti. And if we can do it to the sun, we're probably going to do it to those nearby stars. That would be the ultimate, you want an unambiguous signature. That's to me what would make it pretty close to unambiguous. You might have one or two outlier stars in the galaxy that are doing something weird. But it'd be really bizarre if they all happen to be in the same precise region of showing the same star lifting signature of having all of their stars not just following a peculiar track, but following a peculiar track such that their luminosities are fixed in time. That would be very, very suspicious to be happening in one location. So I'm quite excited about the idea of looking for that. And I've been saying to my student, if anyone's ever going to build a Dyson sphere, they would definitely do this first. Why would you build a Dyson sphere, which is a much more challenging engineering problem? Any kind of structure like that is a massive engineering problem. What's the point of doing that unless you maximize the lifetime of your star? which is actually far easier, I think, from an engineering perspective. So I think those two things are, uh, you know, you'd all, I always w- would almost argue that star lifting would always be a precursor to any kind of Dyson sphere technology. That would be, speaking of ambiguous, that would basically be unambiguous. If you right. had a cluster of, of messed up stars that are showing that signature, and you could then infer all kinds of things because how far did they go? Where does the line between altered stars and natural stars, where is the line? So that actually, to me, is more exciting in a way than something like the WOW signal, because the WOW signal just says they have radar mm. or some kind of radio technology, and that's all it says. But, and you can, you may never know anything more about that civilization than that, yeah. that <laughs> they have radar. Whereas in this case, you know the extent of that civilization and how far they reached. and. I think it would be, at least as far as I can tell, that would be a very good candidate for an unambiguous signal as if you had that group of altered stars. Yeah. Or for that matter, terraform planets, yeah. <laughs> exoplanets that are just not the way they should be in nature. And I wonder if that is the more fruitful way to go as opposed to radio astronomy. What are your thoughts on that? I agree. I mean, you're, you're preaching to the choir here. This is exactly what I was saying on Monday. I was speaking with Jason Wright, who's, a, who's a, the organizer of the conference. And, you know, he did this search for, you can extend this logic to, or you can extend it to the salted stars that we just talked about, but you could also extend it to galaxies as well. And, you know, Jason did this search, I thought it was really interesting, as part of his GHAT program, where he wanted to know how many galaxies, what fraction of the galaxies have been basically turned into Kardashev type three civilizations. So they've, they are, they're dark. They are missing so much light that they look like pretty much the majority of stars have been converted into Dyson spheres. And so he surveyed 100,000 galaxies, roughly, you know, not precisely, but around that number of galaxies looking for anomalously, visibly dim, infrared bright things. He didn't find that many candidates, unfortunately. But I said to him, you know, the, the, he had one or two that showed, you know, high levels of reprocessing and they were kind of ambiguous as to what was really going on with them. And I said to Jason, you know, the cool thing to do would be to ask, are the ones that you have, the candidates you have, co-located on, in, in, term, in physical three-dimensional space? And I don't think they've ever checked for that. As far as I'm aware, I don't think anybody's ever really thought of doing this, but it seems to be a very obvious thing to do. Because if a civilization is capable of spanning out to their whole galaxy, they're probably going to have the capability of getting out to the neighboring galaxies as well. And so you might indeed see pockets. And this kind of gets into kind of the grabby aliens hypothesis that you have aliens spreading out in this kind of aggressive way. And so that would be a, a, a signature that would have, there's no way galax- one galaxy could possibly influence the next galaxy like that. There's just no causal connection between them in terms of the gas physics and the stellar physics. They're completely independent. They're decoupled, we would say. And so whenever you have systems like that, decoupled systems showing the same anomalous signature, that it has to be engineering. There's no other explanation as far as I'm aware. So yeah, I agree. I think that'd be, a, it's, it's a, a case that you can apply to star lifting, but it's an argument that you can apply to many, many types of technical signatures of clustering of these sign- of, of clustering of what would normally be an ambiguous signature becomes to me an unambiguous signature. And we are out of time. Everybody should check out David's channel on YouTube, the Cool Worlds channel. And David, I want an exo exo moon detection or lack thereof. I'll take either one because they're both equally interesting. So I wish you great luck. I hope for a result as far as answering the question on whether exomoons exist. 
we'll get there we'll get there and i think it's just a life lesson guys for you listeners we all have dreams and challenges that we have to work towards and persistence is sometimes the most valuable skill you can have and so i'm dedicated to trying to answer this scientific question and i know many of you are interested in it and together we'll get there Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.